How are you? How is everyone? All well, I hope. I just got to make sure I've got sound because everything else has crashed, crashed this morning. Oh dear, oh dear, what are we doing? Yes, I've got sound. That's a good start. Oh dear, oh dear. Hey, welcome. Now, I'm Stephen. This is the Carpet Tech Woodworking YouTube channel, and we're here to share some tips, tricks, and techniques on anything woodworky. I've just got to make sure I'm actually going through. I know it's not your problem, but I tell you what, I just love it when things go wrong. I've, I've got the air conditioner on, it's at 20 degrees, and I've got to tell you, I am hot. Uh, let me see, let me see, let me see. I don't know, I guess we're live. I'm, gonna, <laughs> I'm just, it's all right, I'll talk to myself. Uh, oh, is that me? I must be. Yep, I'm, I, thank goodness I made it. Well, again, welcome to the Carpet Tech Woodworking Channel. I'm Steve, and um, today we're going to do, were, might, I don't know, um, techniques, finishing techniques, texturing with timber and what have you. But basically, this is your stream. So if you've got any woodworking queries, questions, problems, uh, not anything other than woodwork, I'm not interested in that, but any woodworking problem, happy to help if I can. And we'll work through it if you want to know about any specific tools, how to use things, how to get a finish, how to do this. What I have been asked and what I'm going to start with before I get into doing some texturing is how to fit hinges to boxes. That's something that came up, um, I think it was yesterday. So I was, oh, how do you fit a box, hinge box? Hinge box, box hinge. So what I was doing, when I got my cameras all lined up again, I was trying to tighten my trimmer up so we can do that. Oh, hey, I even got the chat open. So people are most likely talking to me and thinking I'm very rude because I am not on chat. And I tell you what, this is, it's funny, you know your own software, but when you're on another platform, it's different. But we'll be there in a minute. Live, that's us. So we should be. All right, let's do that. And hopefully chat will come up. And if chat comes up, I'm going to be... It hasn't come up yet. Wait. <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Just bear with me. Bear with me. We'll get there. Uh, settings, maybe it's there. And this is the sort of thing, too, you can't... People say, oh, why don't you rehearse it before you start? Well, you can't, because the only way you can tell if everything's working when you're live is when you're live. So oh, I'm sorry, and I'm not going to get up at one o'clock in the morning to see if I can work it out. Oh, uh, dear. Get out of that. So, oh, look, I'll show you what I'm... No, I won't show you what I'm doing. It's too... It's too complicated. Um, ba -ba -ba -dum -bum. Oh... Oh, here we go. This might be the one. No, I can't find chat for love nor money. Live stream. Yeah, there we are. I'll see if I can pull it out of I can't that. Find chat for love nor money. Oh, I'm talking to myself. Hang on. Oh, Wait. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. I'll see if I can pull it out of that. There we go. All right. If I get that out and I. Click that, you should come out, and then I can see what's happening. Mitch, hi Steve, I've been, it's been a while, I hope you're all well, and the fat, oh well, I could fill you in on that. If it was my channel, I would, I'd tell you, I just had a new granddaughter, and the wife's down in Sydney, and um, I miss her greatly, because I've got to do the washing and ironing and cooking myself. No, that's chauvinistic, I won't say that, no, it's... It's good, but I tell you what, five guys in the shed, or in the shed, <laughs> in the house, we're doing all right. But um, hopefully Susie gets back next week. Good morning, Trevor. You charmer, you. So you're going to give your cold to an orphanage. Well, good on you, mate. And what is she who must be obeyed brought you to sup on this morning, my friend? You spoil rotten, you know that, don't you? Hang on, I'll be with you in a TikTok soon. Oh, look at that, I found the right spanner. Things are looking good. I, I wasn't sure if we'd be streaming, apart from 
well, my, well, not all my cameras, my main camera went down, but it was raining and I've got all this noise on the roof. Oh, did nothing yet. Hang in there, mate. Be persistent. It will happen. Um, all right. So what I'm going to do, here we go. No, not persistent. Yeah, be persistent in your patience, mate, and it'll, it will happen. What's that old Rachel Hunter thing? It won't happen overnight, but it will happen. I'm just setting this up. I tell you what I am into at the moment. I'm into turn and resin. I'm fascinated by it. It was something I never thought I'd do. And I quite find it quite cathartic. But I'll give you the drum. If you're going to do it and you're using resin and timber, you use a softish wood. I was doing it with really hard burl and... Um, yeah, well, wasn't a nice experience, I can tell you. But we learn, we learn. Let's see. That should work. Now you love that word, should. Good to hear. Oh, isn't that nice? Thanks. Thanks, Mitch. Yeah, I, I, I turned to one. I, <laughs> I turned one the other day, Trevor, and the chicken would have said, put it back. Oh, it was, it was, I was going well. Um, I wasn't using a really good colour and it went milky and then all of a sudden, ah, it, um, as I said, hard timber, I got a catch and <laughs> it flew out of the lathe and that was the end of that. Anyway, let me just see if I've got the right depth here. If I have, we'll slide into this. And uh, I'll show you a couple of tricks with putting a box hinge on. Then I'll show you some texturing you can do. I, I was having a look and there's nothing wrong with, um, um, you know, mechanical texturing. That's a come on off. See what happens? Mrs. has le left for a week and a half and I've lost weight. My belt's too loose. <sighs> Hang on. Let me, just, let me just do this. Idiot. Turn it on first. There we go. Oh, what happened there? Weather? Everything went. Oh, we're back. That's my clock. I turned one off. <laughs> That's too much. I'll explain what I'm doing in a, a TikTok. And we'll just get this going first. Uh, that's PDC. Pretty darn close. Yeah, that'll do, I think. Okay. Ah. All right. <clears throat> yeah, what I'm doing at the moment, Trevor, I've um, got a, another bowl that exploded on the lay that was beef wood. And my, my TV's gone off too. Dear, oh dear. Ah. Oh. It was beef wood with a big gum vein in it, and I like the gum vein. But when I was... Um, turning at the bowl gouge, hit a bit of the gum vein, and it decided, I'm just looking at my, I'll show you what I'm looking at. The, the one I'm looking at, I oh, see now I've got, I've got that. That's what I was looking at up there, that screen. There we go. So I had to put mute on or I'll get feedback. Um, yeah, it's a, a piece of beef wood and it just fell from together. So I got some um, epoxy from Carbotech. Uh, what was it? It was the hard, it's up in the other shed, um, hard finish or something. Brilliant stuff. And put it together and put some of that, 
what's the colouring? Um, eye candy. I should remember that, shouldn't I? Eye candy colouring swirls all red. Oh, gee, come up good. So I'm halfway through turning that at the moment, turn the inside out. So when that's finished, I shall show you. Now, what do I want? I'm going to cut this. Mm. Oh, what have I been using on that? Oh. I was cutting some glue the other day. And I obviously didn't clean the saw out. But these are great. That's what I like. You can just, see how quickly you can change the blades. Okay. Pop that in the bin. And what I'm doing here is, I'll, I'll start from scratch, it'll give you a better idea. The biggest problem people, I find, people have with fitting hinges to boxes is the way they fit them, they actually preload the box. Which means when the lid is closed and it doesn't have a clasp or hasp on it, it will pop up like that. So it'll be about that far from the top. So you've got this gap here. The reason for that is they've preloaded the hinges when they're putting together. They didn't do it on purpose. It's just a byproduct of not fitting it properly. I'm just making sure I've got the right, right way around. So what I do is uh, get a piece of one or two pieces of plywood and masking tape and then wrap the masking tape once or maybe twice around the ply, uh, around the veneer not plywood sorry around the veneer and then I tape that to the back of the box like that what that does it gives me an air gap which allows the hinge to close because if not, when you pull a hinge down, it actually closes, but it only closes about that much. And that's what keeps the lid open. Whereas by putting that little piece of veneer behind it, it gives it an air gap so it can close properly. Just got to get rid of that bit of text floating up there. Bum, ba, dum, bum. There you go. Remove, gone. So that's the idea of the strip along the back. Then you get the lid. Um, if you need to, just put a bit of timber underneath it. It's not quite the right size, but it will do to balance it and hold it together. See if we go all cam, see what happens. Oh! That's terrible. I told you I was having technical issues today. Oh dear. Now oh, that can go there. Where's my keyboard? And we can pull that one out to there. And we'll pull Okay, we've got to make this bigger. Bear with me. These things happen. That's why it's called live TV. There you go. Okay, we're all good there. I'll just make, I'll just make sure I'm, I'm all good and everything else. That's looking good. 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 Okay. Oh. Who would have thought to be a woodworker you'd have to be a techie as well? All right, so let's go to all cams 
so you can see just about what I'm doing. So I've got a block under there, and that's just to support that. I've got a little G clamp. If you've got uh, scissor clamps or spring-loaded clamps, yeah, use those just to hold it into place. You will need more substantial clamping when you're actually coming to do the hinges. Uh, we'll see how square it is. And there's no real point in using a square like this and squaring it up. The reason being, your box might not be square to start with. So what I do is use the flat edge and just hold it against the side. And if there is a bit of a difference, just equalize it up. Because when it comes to fitting the hinges, there are little things you can do that can move the box around a bit. But we got to get within the ballpark when we start. Jay, how are you, mate? Lovely to have you on board. Thanks for coming along. <laughs> and the reason, the reason I'm doing this on a Thursday and not as usual on a Saturday is hopefully... Susie's coming home, so I've got to go up to the airport to get her, but I don't know what time the flight is. So I couldn't commit to doing it if I didn't know if I was going to be here. Okay, that's pretty darn close there. Now you've got to work out how far in you want the hinges to be. And I've already done a few here. And I've... I've lost the jig, so we'll just have to rejig. Now you can use one of these all the time, but it's my experience if you do, you'll end up changing the, the setting on it and it won't be the same as all the other ones. So all I'm going to do now is mark, if I can find a pretzel. There we go. Okay. So there on... I think I'll use a knife, actually. It's going to be more accurate than that. Oh, no, I won't. I'll cut on the outside of it. It'll be fine. Oh, well, I'm good, thanks, Jay. It's a bit warm, though. There we go. Now, I'm just going to cut that. Oh, run a chisel. Where's the sharp one? Just run a chisel up that cut line on the waist side. I just thought I could just go over the docking saw and do it, but I can't. And the reason I can't is because I've got this bit of timber here. But if you do that little chisel cut along a knife cut, you get a nice little fence for your saw to sit up against. And it's, is it three ply or five ply? That's five ply, but it's birch five ply. Won't take long to cut through. There we go. And that is just beautiful. Okay, so now that is my jig. Tell you what, if I could find stuff, I would be so happy. Oh, it's a pencil. 
You remember those, Trevor? You remember the day? The old pencil cases. So I'm going to mark that and write hinge on it. And that's... And I'll even put today's date. Well, I don't know if it is today. <laughs> I just wrote the 4th of September, 84. Oh, dear, oh dear. It's the 3rd of September. It doesn't matter. Don't care. All right. And I've got a mark there so I know where the... to put it up against there. And that'll give me the same gap all the way around. So... We put it on uh, on the edge. Can we do it any better? Can we do it any better? Let's have a look. Oh dear. I don't know if this one goes up or not. Perhaps it doesn't. Oh, here we go. Will that do anything? No, oh, I thought that might have a... No. Oh, here we go. There's a handle on the side. I'm not used to these... These um, tripods, because they're not my usual one. There you go. All right. So we put this up against the side of the box, and with a knife, just mark along that face. Now, if I was doing a slightly thicker, thicker box, I wouldn't mark it right across because I'd actually house the hinge in, but there's about half a mil, or maybe a mil, between the um, front of the box and the end of the hinge. If I open this up, there you go. So really, to have that little piece of timber there, it's not worthwhile. That's why I'm going all the way through. Notice I only cut on the outside. I haven't marked the inside yet. And again, there's a reason for that. And the reason is, that's blunt. The reason is not all hinges are made the same. Doesn't matter if they're pressed or you know, mass produced like these ones are there will be slight variations in the castings. So you actually put your first line in where you want the hinge to sit from the edge and then your second line actually is the width of the hinge you use. So let's grab a couple of hinges. These are the hinges I'm using, I suppose. Oh, I guess so. So you place the hinge on that line. And then... and then cut down to the hinges on that line that I did with the jig there. And now I'm going to cut down this side of the hinge to give me the correct width. Not a bad idea either. You can use uh, the jig as a fence to hold your hinge up against and then just mark it. And what I always do is I mark right or left. Where's my. Ah, da -dum -bum -bum. 
It's interesting, that's going from together. Let me grab another one. Oh. This will do. Mm. I always mark mine on the top so I know that's it. As I'm looking at the box, this is the right hand side, so I will mark that with an R. So when I put them in the box, I can easily pick it up. R is the right hand one and the R goes to the top. You can work out whatever method you like, but for me, that works the best. So what I'll do with this one, I'll put it an L. So I've got an L there. The same thing, put that up against there. Put that up against there as well. And then with a knife, just mark there. So I don't know how well you can see it, but I've now got a mark here for the width of that hinge and a mark there for the width of that hinge. Here's where it's reasonably important to have a little bit of weight behind it or um, support behind it. So what I'm going to do is just reinforce those lines using a chisel. Now a sharp chisel is a good thing. And you're not hitting down too hard, but you're just redefining that cut that you put in. That's it. And I've got the flat edge of the blade actually resting in that cut. Now I know that flies in the face of what I've said before, if you're cutting tenons or mortises and what have you, but this is a plywood box and I'm actually just cutting through the ply. I'm not trying to remove a lot of timber. So you'll find that it won't move. And the same on the other side. So they've just been punched in a little harder. Now, what I was doing before was setting the router up. So the router bit is actually poking out half of the width of that barrel. If it's a little bit over, it doesn't really matter, but you don't want it um, any less or else you're going to have a hinge sitting proud. So if you have a look at that's the test cut I did and it's just about halfway up that barrel. That's the first test I did. It was way too deep. <laughs> I just read your comment. Jay, yeah, look, I tend to agree with you. Um, okay. So now we can either cut those out if that's going to work. No, it's not going to work. So what I will do is I'll do these separately. Separate these. And we'll do these one at a time.
I've got something caught here and I can't figure out how it got caught there. Anyway, all right. So let's go. At the moment I can take, can take this off and we'll put it on again shortly. I might start on the inside just to see how we're going. If you make a mistake and it's on the inside, you can cover it up. You make a mistake and it's on the outside, you can't cover it up. I reckon that's, that's pretty good. Now, I'm not going to take it necessarily right up. Which one are we on? I'm not going to take it right up to this line. I'm going to leave that there a little bit so I can cut it back with a chisel. Now I know we're right, I don't care if I do the inside or the outside. But make sure you're between the lines. Same to the lid. Now, if you don't have a, a trimmer or a small router, it doesn't matter. I just do that because it's convenient and I've got a lot to do. You can use a, an old woman's tooth plane or a, a cordless router or whatever you want to call it. And exactly the same setup. You just do what I did there. And then set this depth to halfway along the barrel of the hinge. Don't need that in there so that can come out. Oh, no, I can't. Let me, let me, let me, let me just take that fence off. And with this, if I was doing this, I wouldn't take it at one pass. I'd take two or three passes and just gently, you can't see it because I'm right-handed, but anyway, left-handed. But yeah, just gently take it down to the depth that you need. And again, don't go into this area that you've actually marked because that's your, your limits, if you like. What we can do with that now is come back with a chisel and clean it right out. And then come back in. Never have your hand in front of the chisel because if it slips, you're going to be in all sorts of bother. And you put blood all over your job and it doesn't look good. Uh, 
And that doesn't look square to me, but that's all right. These things happen. Same at this end. You don't want to go deeper than your hinge cut because it'll show through on the back of the job if you do. Which isn't a good look. There we go. Do a test fit on the, the bottom one. So I've got the R going to the top. And that's what we're looking for, a nice fit like that. So it's not sloppy and it's not super tight. It just sort of hangs in there. Got to find that other one now that I put the L on it. There we go. Okay. That one's a little bit looser. Well, I said it didn't look too square, but anyway. That's what we're looking at at the moment. Do the same to the top. If you've got a, a finished top like I've got here, it's an idea to put bit of cloth underneath so you're not going to mark the top of your job. Make sure your chisel is very sharp and apart from it's good woodworking practice to do that if it's not, and you've got to use excessive force when you're clearing out this piece here, you can push so hard, you can damage the plywood or timber underneath and lift it up. So if you've got nice, sharp chisels, you'll get a nice, crisp edge. And the same with this one. I mean, to fit hinges properly, it's not... It's not as easy as just getting a hairline hinge and whacking four Phillips head screws into it. This is a bit of an art with hinges that are unfortunately is being lost because we've got all these new hinges around. I think it's the same as with screws. I love using, especially if I'm doing fine furniture, where possible I'll use slot, slotted screws because then you can line the screws up and it just shows that extra little bit of care or style that you bring to your craft. Whereas Phillips said, yeah, you can line them up, but they don't look as nice or regimented as slotted screws that are all dressed. I remember doing a job, well, years ago now, 
and um, it was a fairly expensive box I made for some people and it had marquetry on the inside and marquetry on the outside and when they came to get it the first thing the husband said was look at those screws they're all dressed so people do notice people do notice and then he had to explain what dress screws were but it, to me, it's a, it's a mark of a craftsman. I'm not putting myself in that bracket by any means. But I, I try. Anything that, anything that makes my job look better has got to be worth a try. Okay, so that one goes there. And that one goes there. So now we've got nice fit there. I, I got to have a coffee, I think. I'm, <laughs> I'm dying of thirst here. Cup of tea and fruitcake. Good on you, Trev. All right, we'll go back to this piece of stuff I've got here, which is two pieces of veneer. I don't know what they are. They might be um, 0.06 or 0.07. It doesn't really matter within that ballpark. And then masking tape. And I put that and you have it so it's just below where the hinges are going to poke out. A good test to see if you've got a good fit with the hinges is put it together like that and just poke the hinges in that slot. If they fit in there nicely, then you're not going to have much dramas. But if they fit in and actually lift the back of the box up, then you're going to have dramas. Whereas if I'm looking at that, oops, it's going a bit too far. Wait a minute. Yeah. Okay, so if it looks like that, that's okay. But if when you put it in, and you don't put the hinges all the way home like I did, but if you've got a gap like that, then you're going to have problems. So let's be about it again. We will do some texturing, I promise. And the reason I have two clamps is if I've got one, the box can slip, whereas if I've got two, it's a good chance it won't slip. Let's go a bit that way. Okay, so. So, 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 so. That's going to be pretty darn close, I think. That's it. Okay, so they're lining up. Now we've got that gap in between it because we've got that veneer and masking tape. Open the hinges up and place them in.
And what you want is that barrel to be in the middle of that crack. If you have it too far forward on the bottom, it's going to mean that the lid comes out at the front. And if you have it too far back, it means it's going to poke out at the back. Now I've got oh, one of these. And where's my gun? That'd be right. I haven't got a gun here. Okay, what you can use, or I might just have to do these with a drill, but this is a retractable drill bit. So when I push on the drill itself, the drill comes out. This is a spring-loaded sheath over there, and it's also chamfered on the end, which means when I'm drilling a hole, it will centre in the countersink and when I push it will give me a drill hole right in the middle. But if you haven't got one of those you're just going to have to guess it which is what I'm going to have to do here because I haven't or I can't, can't find mine. a punch. Is it a punch here? This might do. So hold it there. Define the middle best you can. Just put a punch mark. Now I only do two screw holes. I don't do all of them at once because if I need to adjust it means I've still got two good bits of wood there I can adjust into. And I will show you if you make a mistake and you drill in the wrong place, there's an easy fix for that too. All right, here's a very, very small drill. I'm using I think the number two screws these little brass screws here not very big at all it's always good especially when you're using brass screws in particular use a bit of soap to lubricate the thread there's nothing worse than spinning the head off a screw when you've just about finished the job and it just makes a mess of everything. So I'm using an old egg beater here. You could use, if you've only got a, um, a power drill, use that. I like this because it gives me much more control over my drilling and I know I won't go through the top of the box. Go down a little bit deeper than your screw is long and that way you're not going to bottom out. Again with brass screws, the reason for that is they are very, very fragile and they will break. Whereas if you go a bit deeper than the length of the screw, you've got the, the benefit of the thickness of the hinge or part of the hinge that will give you a bit of relief as well. Okay, so rub a bit of soap on the thread of the hinge, or on the thread of the screw. Just start it by hand. <coughs> um, I would suggest even if you're using Phillips head screws, do them by hand, don't do them with a screwdriver bit in a battery gun because you can strip the heads off them so easily. When you're getting down near to the end, I turn and then back it off a quarter of a turn, give it a little bit more, back it off a little bit more. 
that way you're clearing the lands of the screw and that will also prevent it from blocking. Ah! Boom, 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 boom. There we go. Okay, I'm just about level with the hinge now, so I'm going to back it off a quarter turn or half a turn and then go back in, nearly home, back it out, put it back in, nearly home, back it out. And now I'm not worried about dressing it at this stage. So that's one screw in and it's looking reasonable. So this one, get the R at the top. Make sure she's home. <clears throat> I'm coming to your place, Trevor. I could do some fruitcake right about now. La -da -da -da. Ah! Oh, you, oh, you can tell when I'm concentrating, can't you? Because I'm quiet. Doesn't happen often. Here we go. And pop the other one in. And as I said, I'm not worried about dressing them or initially I, I don't care about screwing them all the way in. There we go. Okay. Now this is where, if you've got any adjustments to do, this is where you're going to be doing it. I just, I didn't put that second clamp on then, did I? All things being equal, when I shut that lid, all things being equal, when I shut that lid, it should go bang. If it doesn't, I've got too much preload in it. You ready? That's what you want to hear. All right, now, let's have a close-up look at it. That's fitting tight, and if you run your hands around it, it's pretty darn nice all the way around there's no preload on it so with that i will then go ahead and put the rest of the screws in if it wasn't lined up or whatever i can do this see i've got a bit of slop there i can do this to get it lined up so it's nice and smooth then carefully open it then put the new screws in if it's out and you can't jiggle it loosen the screws off a little bit and then you can just manipulate the lid until you can feel it square all the way around now if you screw something so that's how to oh then obviously you you go ahead drill the other holes and put your other screws in i'm not going to do that because i've got a lot more work to do on this box so i know now the screws are fitted so i can take this off and i'll go on to the next box not not now, but later on. But I'll show you if I had a bit of an incident the other day with one <clears throat> and I just could not get the box top square and I'd drill the holes um, and put the screws in, but there's no way in the world it would line up. So in that case, I start from scratch. And what I did was you can see there, 
I put a toothpick in the, the hole. So just an ordinary toothpick from the dollar store. I've got one to fix up here, so I'll do it here. I personally prefer matchsticks because I think matchsticks have a better timber in it for a screw to adhere to. Most of them are poplar, whereas you'll find most of these toothpicks are bamboo <clears throat> and they don't screw as, or they don't accept a screw as nicely as um, a, a real timber or poplar does. So where's some glue? Oh. Cool, all you do is just put a dab of glue, this hole here, a dab of glue over the hole, and then a little bit of glue on the end of the matchstick or the toothpick or whatever it is you're using. Find the hole, make sure you get the glue down in there nicely. Then push it home, trim it off a couple of mil above what you want. Now with a hammer, just really bash it down. Now leave that, and then the next day you come back, they're dry like this, and then all you gotta do is just cut it off. Whoops, and what did I say would happen if you push too hard? Just happen, it's all right, we'll fix it. So, apart from this bit I just damaged then, but you can see now we don't have a screw hole there. We can screw or drill again and get a brand new um, hole. But what I'll do with that while I'm here, so if I don't do it now I'll forget. Yeah, it's a bit of good stuff, super glue, I love it. <clears throat> Put that in the place. I'm just going to put my other glasses on so I can see if we got a good fit there, which it appears that we do have. Okay, now a bit of, bit of, bit of, bit of, bit of, bit of, bit of tape to hold that down. And we can finish that off, or I'll finish that off at a later stage. I'll, I'll do this one, but this time I'm going actually into the void, so I don't have that. So I don't have that same problem. So that was a graphic example of what I said earlier that can happen if you push too hard. All right. So that's how you get out of the problem if you drill a hole in the wrong place. What's all this rubbish keeps coming up here? I just got a, a Google alert. Whatever. Remind me later. Goodness gracious. Okay. Um, so we're, yeah, okay. So that's it. If you do accidentally drill in the wrong place and you're putting a hinge in, that's the way to fill it for a box. If it's a, um, a door and it's a bigger hole and it's DIY sort of thing, just shave off a wedge of any sort of timber and then cut a point on it and just hammer it in with a bit of glue, leave it and then you're good to go again. All right, let's have a look at some texturing because that's what I said we'd do. And finishes. Oh, look, there's so many great products on the markets nowadays. I've got um, some Libron stuff. This, this is uh, a new range they bought out called Metal Waxes and that's Silver Ash. 
and then I burnt it, we'll do some burning in a minute, I burnt it, then put the wax on it and then turned the inside of the bowl. So it gives a sort of a, a pewter looky thing. Um, there's another one over here. I think this is a bronze. Um, that's New Guinea rosewood. So you've got the beautiful gold inside and you've got this effects wax on the outside. There's a lot of talk about, and there's absolutely, as I said before, there's absolutely nothing wrong with them. Um, wish me glasses so I can see. Um, uh, you know, oh, what are they called? Rotary cutters. I mean, there's, there's air rotary cutters, there's electric rotary cutters. In fact, the, the um, I've got one in there, the, the new Carbotech jigsaw uh, comes out with a rotary cutter as an accessory that runs off the back of the saw, which is a brilliant idea. It's sort of two tools in one. And you can do a lot of designs with those, but initially I just want to talk about doing manual um, texturing and what you can do just with things you might have lying around. We'll make a couple of punches and uh, cheap paint, waxes and stuff like that. So let me find my desk on my workbench and we will be away. Oh, don't you hate it when super glue drives on your finger? It's horrible. Nasty stuff. That's good. It's good. Woodworker's friend, I reckon. Oh, dear. <whistles> Would you believe this shed was tidy two days ago? Oh, dear. Now, when you're doing texturing too, it's important to take into account what sort of timber you're using because some texturing works really, really well on softwoods, whoops, like um, pine, uh, cedar, uh, what else have we got? Uh, camphor laurel. Jacaranda, it, it works nicely, but you try those same techniques on Red River gum, uh, ebony, lignum vitae, um, yellow box, a cooler bar, and there's a good chance they won't work. So you need a different approach depending on what timber. Now, when I'm talking about hardwood, it's not the botanical classification. A lot of people that, oh, is it hardwood? Yeah, it's hard. Well, that's not hardwood. What I'm talking about here is if it's hard or it's soft. For example, balsa wood is classified as a hardwood. Cypress pine, I believe, is a softwood, but it's a downside harder than balsa wood. So that's the botanical references to soft and hard. So when I'm talking, when you're texturing, I'm talking about the actual wood itself. Uh, the um, density, there you go. There's a word for the week. The density of the timber, not the, by whatever, what is it? The biology? Yeah, or the biology of the thing, or the um, classification, whether it's a hardwood or not. Oh dear, this is uh, an old piece of stuff I, I've had kicking around for ages. Um, so I was going to copy it and actually put it in. Let me give it a bit of a blow. Putting it in to a piece of furniture. It's a door panel. It's arts and crafts, which to me, it's silky oak, so it's Australian. I would say it was very, very early 1900s. I don't think it's 1800s, but I would say about 1903, 1905. And if you look at the design, there's no CNC work in that. There's no copy work. That's all just done by, by hand. 
We're not going to do the lily so much, but what I will do is show you how to get this texturing in the background and how you can raise and lower whatever it is you're putting on. So that's obviously a relief carving where the background has been taken away and you've got this lily and it's a stylized lily, which are very popular in arts and crafts, um, raised. I wonder, and I'm just, I just having a wonder here. Yeah, okay. And the lily is below the surface of this framework around it. And then you've got the mitering around the framework. So you've got various depths in the one panel and the depth that you can put in also changes the texturing you're doing. So there's a lot of things you can do with hand planes and simple punches and one or two carving chisels. You don't need a lot of carving chisels. One or two will get you out of strife. There's one, I'm going to clean that now. There's, I don't know what I was cutting with that. <laughs> Excuse me, I just got to, where's, now? Yeah. Oh. I'll try a brass brush on it. I don't know what the heck I was. I don't know what I was thinking. I was in a rush. I must have been in a rush. Hmm. Have to get a new saw blade, I think. Um, what was I talking about? Oh, yes. There's one particular chisel which I'll share with you that I use a lot with texturing. And it's one of my favorite um, designs, I think. I did have, where'd that one go? Oh no, that's over there. Um, you can do carving, of course, which, which gives you design and texturing, but that is a different um, area altogether because it means laying out designs and then carving the design and going whatever. What I'm talking about is just feel how you can take something that's smooth and give it something that makes it a little bit special. What have we got here? That's a, another video you'll see shortly. Um, so, let's see, what do we do first? Uh, oh, I know. Ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum. Put these away, go over here. <laughs> Put those there so I can kick them over later on. Oh. All right, we'll do, I'll just sand that back a bit. <coughs> if I can find the 100 grit. Oh. Sanding by itself will give you a lot of texturing too. If you're wondering why that doesn't make dust, I've got, oh, let's see if I can find it. I don't know what it's called, but it, it really is such a good thing down there. It's a little Festool um, suitcase dust collector. So it's got a bag inside it and it's got two switches. So when I turn my sander on, the dusty automatically comes on. And in confined spaces, it is brilliant. We actually bought it, we were doing a show a while ago inside the house. And I couldn't afford to have any dust in the house. So as soon as you... See how it comes on so quick? Um, but yeah, we couldn't have any dust in the house. So that's what we got that one for. All right, let's have a look see. I might divide this off into some areas where is my knife oh. 
Even with a knife, you can do great things. Oh, we, we might even might even take a bit of care and divide this properly. So if I wanted to divide that in half, instead of measuring it, Vince, good day, much. How much have you missed? Oh, not much. You can always go back and look at it. So instead of that, I, don't, I have no idea what that number is there. But if I wanted to divide that in half, I'm going to put the corner of the ruler on this edge and I'm going to swing it around until I get something that my poor brain can divide in two. Now I've gone to 20, which is 200 mil. And all I'm going to do is put a mark where the 10 is. And that magically is in half. Um, I shared that when we were doing dovetails a while ago. It's a great way of dividing things up. Um, all right, what we might do, uh, yeah, we might do that in a little bit, okay. So, <clears throat> what can we do with texturing? One of the best things you can do is, honestly, make your own punches up. So, I, I've got a, did have, I've got a set here that I made years ago, and I'll make another one for you today. But these are so easy to make, and you can make them to whatever specification you want. Oh dear. Tell you what I am looking for. Oh, I'll find that in a bit. And isn't that typical? The ones I wanted to show you I can't find. So we'll make one. That's it. We've got the technology. Hook in. All right. What this is, this is just, I believe, 8 mil or 5 sixteenths for us old guys. Okay, that's 8 mil, 5 sixteenths. This is just uh, steel stock that you can buy from a, um, a steel yard. But the other thing, and what I have used, and generally do use, but I didn't have any, that's why I cut the stock up, is just go to the big box warehouse or a nut and bolt place and go buy a couple of five inch cuphead, screw, uh, cuphead bolts. Then what you do is you cut the head off and you cut the screw thread off and then you've got a nice mild steel rod that's nice and flat, or nice and flat, nice and round. So not having that, what we'll do, we will go from scratch and we'll make a punch. We might make two, I don't know, we'll see how we go. So if you've got a grinder, that's brilliant. We might even, uh, it wrecks your grinding wheel, so I've got, let me just get a grinder up here. Oh, don't worry about me back. It's all right. Oh, oh, I'm showing off now, I know, but <laughs> this is the only grinder I had <laughs> kicking around. Um, this actually is a slow speed grinder, which is lovely. I love using it because after using the normal speed ones, which are 2850, this one is runs at 14.40 and you'll hear the difference if you're used to grinders when I turn it on you'll definitely hear the difference there you go yeah listen to this ah oh, love it isn't that it's isn't that nice and quiet? Okay, so get a bit of, I don't even know how long this is. I just quickly cut it this morning. That's about 100 mil uh, long of 5 8 or 100 mil of, <laughs> four inches of 5 8 or 100 mil of uh, 8 mil 
or get a 500, 500, a five inch, five sixteenth cup head bolt, cut both ends off. Okay, so I'm just gonna round the edges over. So it's nice and smooth. Do it more on one than the other. And I don't know if you can see, I've got a dag on that, so I'm just gonna take the dag off. The trick when you, you've got round bar and you're trying to get it flat is roll it in your fingers like that as you're going across the wheel, rather than going straight in, because if you just go straight in, you'll actually get a, a dip. And it depends on the size of the wheel you're using is how bad it gets. Okay, so that's nearly flat. Okay. Where's, where's, so that's flat. Now I'm just going to take this sharp edge off. Not exaggerated, that end I've taken a fair bit off, but this is the end I'm going to hammer and it'll get peened over. But while I'm putting the design in, oh, isn't that so quiet? Oh, it loves it. Oh, I really do. Um, this end, we're going to put a design in, so I don't want to encroach on the design I'm putting in. So I'll wait until that stops. We'll come down here. Let me just encourage it to stop. I'm not picking it up when it's spinning, I tell you. Okay. Um, several ways you can do this. If you've got a metal vice with soft jaws, it would most likely work better, but I've just got this wooden vise, so that's what I'm going to be using down here. There you go. Now, you can use a hacksaw if you've got a sharp hacksaw. And cut slots along the top. This isn't particularly sharp. That's the other reason I use bolts or stuff like that, because it, it's mild steel, and you want mild steel. You don't want hardened steel or tool, tool steel. It's too hard to work. You're only putting it in timber, so it really doesn't matter. I'm just going to change my speckies so I can see much more better. There we go. Up to you how many slots you want to cut in. but you don't have to go down too deep. And it's not rocket size, right? So it doesn't matter if it's not dead straight or the intervals aren't totally even. So that's what I've done so far. Ha! I, I can't see without my other glasses. I can't, I can't see what you're seeing. There you go. All right, now the other thing, if you've got, it's much better, is a saw file. I mean, don't use your real good ones. These are really expensive ones, but just a normal hardware one will do. If you don't have one of those, you can get away with a half round, but they're not as successful as a triangular, 
triangular one. Now with those saw cuts, what you do is you put the face of the blade in there and a good little habit you can get into is you can buy this chalk, big boxes of a kindergarten chalk, I think for two bucks. Just have some of that in your workshop whenever you're using a file. If you rub the chalk down the file, it actually goes into the lands. So when you're filing, your filing, filings will go in to the lands, which is the area between the teeth. And if you haven't got the chalk in there, there is a file card, which looks like this. Whoops. Okay, this is what they call a file card. And the idea is you run it into your teeth and you can see this chalk here. See how easily that comes out? Now, the chalk comes out easily, but what is the major benefit is the iron filings that you've made are sitting on top of the chalk. So it's not as if, and I don't know if I've got any bad ones here. Let me have a look. No, because I, I use chalk all the time. But sometimes if you're filing and you don't use chalk, that will fill up with iron filings and the file becomes less than useful. So again, I put the wrong one on. So I'm just putting chalk on all three faces. Where you've made those saw cuts, doesn't matter where you start, just put the pointed end of the file, these are 60 degrees, and just backwards and forwards, into those cuts. The smaller the tapered file, the more refined your pattern's going to be. So keep that in mind. This one could be fairly bold, I think. You don't have to go in too deep. see what I'm doing but what you do want to do is go in deep enough that you've got a nice V forming and you don't have um, any flatness on the top between the saw cuts. Okay, now if you look at that, you might not be able to see it, but I can feel it. These ridges at the top are sharp. So you don't want any flat ridges on the top of what you've done. Now turn it 90 degrees. You can, if you like, go back in with a saw and cut at 90 degrees down to the depth that you had before. You can put as many cuts in it as you like. There's no, there's no rules to it. So, blade's just about ready for the knackers, yeah? And we might just put one more in there. That gets quite warm too when you're sawing and filing it.
Now go back to the file and do exactly the same in those saw cuts that you've just made that way. And then go back to your original cuts. What you want now is to have a lot of little points on there. And we'll see how that's going to look. Um, you can, again, this is when I would now, I'm not, I'm not bending down to pick it up again, but this is where I would go back to the grinder and just take these sharp edges. Just, which one are we on? There you go. Just take all these sharp edges off because they will cut you. But I'm just going to use a, a file. And I'm just drawing it from the edge in. And that, that's more for my comfort than anything else. So it's not sharp on the outside. And that's what we got. So let's see how it works. The idea when you're using it is to um, move it around and spin it, sort of like that in your fingers, and move it around as you go. Uh, I might just, if I can find a compass, we might just draw a circle. There we go. Whoops. Uh, I'll do another one out here. So now I've just drawn a circle. And we've got to work out where we want to do it. So I'm sort of thinking, um, I might do it on the outside of the circle. So, get a hammer. Oh. And you're just twisting Whoops, <laughs> I got the wrong one. Even that makes it interesting. That's where it was cut off on the, uh, with the hacksaw. And we're getting a nice pattern there. So we'll just keep doing this for a little bit. But you notice how I'm just above the wood and I'm twisting, twisting that punch and moving it around randomly. That is quite a nice effect. Don't you love things when things go wrong the right way? They're not huge, violent hammer blows. Just tap it, I suppose that's what I could use. I could use a smaller hammer if I wanted to. 
So it all depends what your wrist is like. All right. Now, that was a complete boo-boo, but that is quite pleasant. I think that's quite nice. I've got to find the one I made now. Okay, here's the one I made. Here's one I made earlier. And... Um, and we might do inside the circle with this one. You notice I've actually got it above the work and my thumb and finger are acting like a spring. When you start out with a new one, this is digging in quite sort of. All right, it's digging in because basically we've made a lot of nails out of it. But if you hold it just above the work and hammer it, where you can be deliberate. And you can sort of get a bit of a woven pattern out of it. Might as well do the whole circle. Oh, my thumb's getting... Oh, thanks, Vince! <laughs> Trevor, you're going to get two sacks of coal. Nearly finished. Look at a toothbrush. Oh, I have two. Good. Okay, and there in itself. Is another. Let's see. Here we go. There in itself is another texture. Now that's the one we've just made. Um, a similar one to that is this one here that I made. So instead of going at 90 degrees, you just go across and then thin it out on. Um, a grinder, take the edges off, or being mild steel, you can, you know, do that just with a file. What I find nice about this one is you can create a frame. If you wanted it dead straight, I'm just sort of following a knife line, but you can get straight lines with that. Um, what else? Even the, the screw, I'll find a, a bolt over here. Even the end of a screw thread, end of a bolt, you can use quite effectively. I had them this morning, where'd they go? I love the way things disappear in my workshop. There 
There was a box of bolts there. Wait on, I'll just go out and grab a... If I can't find them, I'll grab a bolt from outside. Hang on, I'll just go and grab a bolt. Says he, hopefully. You're kidding me. Oh, I've got to have some diner bolts here somewhere. Da -da -da. Bum, ba -dum, bum, bum. Here we go. This will do. <clears throat> I prefer a cage bolt, but a diner bolt would do. Right, this is just a normal concrete diner bolt, but any anything with a screw thread. What I normally do is I heat it up and bend it at 90 degrees, so then I can hold it like this and hit the screw thread, but in this case we can't, so we won't. That, that again can give you a beautiful texture and pattern. And at the moment we haven't spent very much at all. I don't know what happens if we go the other way. And it's... Oh, that, that's quite nice too. Oh, I like that. If you go at 90 degrees, which is the advantage of having it at 90 degrees. You have a look at that pattern there. Is it going to do it? So we'll give it a bit of colour and see what happens. This is what makes it really pop. As soon as you start putting a little bit of colour on it. This is just a red. Again, nothing special about the, the paint. It's just a Two dollar. Two dollar a tube job. And that, honestly, is very nice. I don't know if you can see that. And that's just, you know, screw thread. So what else have we got? Um, 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 um. We might even, uh, we might just brush this one over. And that, that, I think, is quite pretty, and yet that was made when I picked up the wrong bit of steel that just had a dag off it when I uh, cut it with a hacksaw. The other things you can do, just straight chisel cuts. Uh, where's the chisel? If you want. Where's my mallet? It's unusual, the back where I put it. So...
Hello, Bob. Do you want to come in? No. Doesn't want to come in. Oh, I thought I heard the young Robert. Whoops. With this, I think you're much better off using a carving chisel, but nonetheless, I'm not taking much time with this, but you know, I overlap there a bit. But again, you get a, a pretty pattern just using a chisel. One of my favourite carving chisels to use, if I can find my carving chisels, and they could be anyway. They were there this morning. Here we go. They're down here. Oh dear. One of my favourite carving chisels to use is a number 810, which is. is, 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 is this one here, I think. No, that's a 97. That's it. That's my favourite chisel for getting um, texture into a job. And you can go with the grain or across the grain. I personally like going across the grain. I think it gives me a much nicer finish. But I will show you. So that pattern in there, that is basically what we did with this punch here. Um, let me just move these. Oh dear. Clear a space here so I can get in. Move that. What have we got? I mean, it's still it's quiet today. Even a ball paint hammer, um, you know, hammer with a, a ball on the end, if you don't whack it too hard, bruise the timber but you don't want to actually break the fibres because then when you put your finish on, you get uh, a really horrible dark mark where the stain or whatever it is you're using has been absorbed uh, into the grain. Oh, this one, we might do this one here. Oh no, I might. I might as well do a knife line. Oh, 
Okay, this I think is one of the prettiest and easiest textures to do. As I said, it's an 810 carving chisel and you're going in and you're just scooping out like that. You can do it like this or like this. Whatever it is, make sure you've got contact with your work, with the, uh, your wrist, and you've got a good firm hand on your chisel. And you've got control of the business end. And then you just go in and out. You can do two ways. You can either have a stop, which is like that. I don't know. Let's, let's see if we can get this camera going here. Okay. This is a fingernail. You can see it just looks like a fingernail. It comes in and it stops. The other way you can do it. Let's see if we can get something. Halfway happening here. Okay, so to get the fingernail one, you go in, cut, and then pull straight up like that. And that'll give you a cut off end. Or you can go in and come out the other end, and then that gives you a taper each end. So the choice is yours. To me, I just like going randomly any which way I want. As I said, I prefer doing this one across the grain and I don't like to leave any flatness there at all. So if it means I'm going over a place I've already gone, well, that doesn't matter. And I can use long strokes, I can use short strokes, whatever. And yeah, look, I've seen these done with grinders and um, rotary tools, and it's, it's effective. But if you haven't got one and you want to get these sort of finishes, you can get away with just one carving chisel. When you're going over it and you see there's any flat spots, just dig in and take the flat spot out because you don't want, well, it's up to you if you want it or not. Personally, I don't like it because it, to me, it, it sort of indicates you haven't gone over your job thoroughly. If there was a lot of flat spots, okay, fair enough. I would say that was an intention. But if there's only one or two, then it's because whoever's doing it hasn't really paid attention to their work. You can go out on a bit of an angle uh, instead of straight across, you know, you can go out a little bit. I don't like going, as I said, up and down because you can lift timber and depending on the wood you're using, it can look a bit horrible. But as you'll see, this doesn't take long and we get a really, really nice effect. And go random, don't just stick in the one spot. And if you have got one that's a fingernail, so you might go like that and then you put another one in and you've got this sharp edge, I would personally just go in there and knock it off. There are so many things you can do once you get a couple of techniques under your belt that you enjoy and sorts your work. Coming back to that panel I showed you with the stylized Arts and Craft Lily. Just by varying the depth of your background, you can create so much more of a feature in what you're doing just by having different levels. 
So what I could do here was when I finished this, I would go over and possibly put a mitre along here so I've got a raised platform for the work to actually be sitting on. Is that still in focus? Let's see how it's looking from the top. There you go. All right, well, we'll put that back in there and we'll bring this in and see what we can do. Uh, if you want to play with resins, this is a beautiful texturing technique to pour resin into because you've got highs and lows. So you could layer your resin. You could put a, a black in there to start with a very thin one and then put another colour on the top and another colour and then when you sand through them you get those layers. That's what I do with a lot of the time with paint. I might paint the background um, black and then put other colours on the top and then when you sand through Especially milk paint. Milk paint is brilliant for this. Or the, the cheap acrylics, they work just as well. Okay, I'm going to go back this way now because I've come to the edge of the board. Okay, I've got a flat area here. I just want to take that out. There's another flat one there. Now depending on what you want to do, I don't have any yellow, but I could, um, let me see what could we do. Yeah, okay, we'll do a, I haven't got any black with me either. Poo. Um, we might put a red, a red in there to start with. Oh! No, we'll, we'll, I'll, I might just put a bit of red in there. See what happens! It's what this is, it's a, it's just suck it and see. So what you can do with that is once that's dried, we, if I can get it over there, we'll accelerate the drying of it. Then you can go to a, say, a 240, I think this is 240, and just lightly sand over the top. I know that'll give you flat areas again, but you've got the contrast and you can go over with a, another colour if you want. Oh, here's a cream. So now you've got another colour thrown in there. And you can build your, your colours up and then put a finish over the top. Um, what are those waxes? Okay, this is bronze effects wax.
and you've got a different effect. Again, you can almost get a, a beaten copper sort of look out of it. So it all depends what sort of finish you put on it. The other one I like doing, if I can find, here you go, this will do. Oh! Won't do too much because it'll get smoky, but burn finishes. You can get just a piece of timber, and again, this is what you have to be mindful of. This won't work on eucalypt, it won't work on, on gum. Um, it's got to be a soft, pithy timber in between that we can burn off. In itself looks quite nice or you can get 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 uh, a wire brush which I'll use that in a minute but the other one I quite like which I can't find. I thought I had some out here. Oh, let me just have a look. No, I've got to be up in, got to be up in the other shed, but you can get uh, nylon pads, like, you know, Brillo pads and scuff it. And it comes up quite nicely. The other thing is, so I can't find that. Find some steel wool. You can use steel wool. And clean it off. With steel wool, which then makes that grain stand up because I've taken all the pith away between the growth rings. If you really want to get into it, you can use a wire, wire brush, which will remove a lot. And I don't know if you can actually f see that. You can definitely feel it. That's about half a mil of hardwoods coming through. Again, I'll use, I'll use a cream. You can put your color onto that. gives you definition, <coughs> excuse me, as well as texture. So that's, that's using a heat gun. Um, you can use propane. Personally, I prefer a map gun. I think it, it does it a lot quicker and a lot better. Uh, the other thing, which is, which is quite nice, is if you've got some straight boards, you run them over if you've got a 
This is something that just started to dress. But if you run it over the jointer quickly, if you have a jointer and you've got you've got these knife marks here, which you might not be able to see, but what I will do is put some liming wax on it and I guarantee they'll pop up if I can find some liming wax. Here we go. Again, this is another um, effects wax that you can get. The thing I like about effects waxes is once you use them, you don't really have to put a finish on there because you've already got the finish on there. the best light to see that in, I really don't. Not sure if that's coming through on camera or not, but we've still got the machining marks underneath, but it's accentuated because you've got a nice wax finish over the top. You're getting into sort of pre French provincial furniture, but it's just another way of adding another level to what you're doing. And not lastly, but one of the last ones I'll cover, I'll just plug it in there, is um, if you've got a burning kit, poker work. Put the, put the top on this. See you, Trevor! Oh, thanks, Jay. Uh, now, you do get, when you buy a burning kit or pie, 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 pieography, I think they're called, um, kit, you get standard oh, tools and little pieces. Now, these are... some of the little nibs that you get when you buy a standard um, burning set or poker set, but it is just as easy and I think much more fun if you make your own. I have a couple of favourites I use all the time. Let me just plug this in. Turn that on and switch that over there. And I will talk to you whilst that's heating up. Um, yeah, so you can make your own extra tools for whatever jobs you want to do. I've got, I think I've actually, yeah, if you look online, there's different um, videos on, on how to make your own branding irons and branding tools. But these, you can buy them and just use the standard ones. That's absolutely fine. But it gives you a whole new range of things you can do with burning this. Where's that one I did have? I've dropped it. Oh dear. Yeah, that's one that I did earlier. So if I can find, where's that bit of wood we had before? That's all it. So this is a 
pattern I just made myself. This looks like a top of an old electric stove and I've used it just around the rim of that bowl and on the outside all I did there was put a groove in and then got a bit of fencing wire and held it on the outside as it turned into the lathe and it, it burnt. So with this So you just put your mark in there. been bent at some stage I'm sure. So you don't have to be really tricky and super artistic making something. You can really pick up points when you put the texturing or design or colour into it. If you, you mess it up, you just go over it again. I'll give that a little bit of a... All right, now where's some... Put some red on that. There you go, there's another idea. So really, and okay, you don't need to buy a pyro setup. Um, you don't need to buy, uh, what else did I use that I, I bought? You don't need to buy a carving chisel, really. These things just give you much more opportunities and increase the scope of what you can do creative, creatively. But if you're stuck in the shed and all you've got are hammers and nails and screws, um, tell you, I'll do one more if I, if I, can, if I can find some screws. 
Um, no, I can't because I haven't got a screwdriver gun down here. But another thing you can do is you get a lump of wood about inch square, three quarter inch square, 19 mil square, 25 mil square, and drill or screw in Phillips head screws. I'm, I'm trying to, there's something going on at the school next to me and I'm, I'm trying to work out what all the bells are. And you've got these Phillips head screws just screwed in on top of each other and put some nails in there. And then you whack your job with it and all these patterns, of the Phillips head screw pattern will come on, the nail heads will come on. What happened years and years and years ago, I used to manage a, quite a large furniture manufacturing operation. And we were on the cutting edge of, this is going back a while, so it would have been mid 90s when, um, what was it called? Distressed furniture was in vogue. That was where they um, used to get rough sawn timber or, and, and that's another thing, timber straight off the saw, off the, the band saw, and finished will give you a nice texture. And you used to put Jack Black Japan on it, which used to highlight all the imperfections, and then you'd spray clear over the top. The challenge I had was I'd just got, I had 35 people working for me on the floor, and I just got them up to the stage where they were building really good cabinetry, and I had to ask them then to wreck it, which didn't go down very well. But what we did is exactly what we did. We got some bits of timber and put nails in it and screw heads and then we'd go over big six by three bookcases and just whack it with this stick, then sand it off, then put the black Japan on and that would highlight the nail marks and the screw marks and then we'd put clear over the top. And the, the silly thing was I was making more money selling destroyed furniture than I was good carcasses. So if I was making a really nice good bookcase, I might have got $200 for it. This is going back a while. Um, but the distressed ones, I was getting $270 for it. So um, anyway, but there's all these things you can do. I, I don't know if that, well, even that might work. There you go. <laughs> we'll just have a look at this. There you go, I just bash that with a wire, a wire brush. And that has given me a different texture again which is quite nice. Put a bit of colour into that and it will come up. Have I got any colour left on the... No, it's all gone, I think. But have a look around at um, what other people are doing. Have a look on um, yeah, uh, Google, see what texturing people are doing. And there is a plethora of it out there. There really is. And you're only limited by your own imagination. There used to be a, uh, a tannery in Brisbane, where I live, and they used, used to buy antique cherry leather. This was years ago, I was making um, chairs and Chesterfields and what have you. And this antique Chesterfield leather was twice the price of normal leather, but what they actually did was they'd get tanned hides that were a, um, a red colour and they would literally throw them face down on the workshop floor and they'd walk over them for about three months and they'd have bits of nails and tacks and boot marks and concrete scuffs and everything and then they'd re-dye it with a black and you got this beautiful antique leather and all they did they got ordinary leather and just work hard it as you like and came up with this uh, beautiful antique leather look. So I don't know, get a couple of bits of timber, put them on the, the shop floor, walk over them for a while. If you've got a bob, give it to Bob to chew. I mean, teeth marks are all the rage. <laughs> no, I don't know. And there are a lot of texturing, particularly for wood turners, but I haven't seen so much around for people that want to make furniture or, or chopping boards or um, serving trays. And so I just thought this might be an idea to share some ideas that I've come up with along the way. And, what I found interesting, the, the trick to me is make it a detail, make it an embellishment, don't make it the focal point. Um, on some bowls that I turned, I've, I've stopped doing it now, I should get back to doing it. What I used to do was I would turn the bottom 
and then with that uh, 810 chisel, I would do this in, in those days, in, well, I still mainly do, an expansion joint. So I've got a dovetail expansion mortise on the bottom of the bowl. I would do that technique there and then paint it. And it, it would be amazing. You'd see people pick up a bowl and they, as soon as their finger touched, they'd turn it upside down. And I did an experiment. I did uh, some green, some red and some purple to see if it would make any difference. And it was really interesting because the red ones, I think, sold better than the purple and the purple sold better than the green. So even though the bowl looked the same, they'd get this feeling they'd turn it upside down and then the colour would appeal to them. And yeah, that way I was selling more just by changing the colour on the bottom of the base. And the truth was, the reason I started doing that because I wasn't competent enough as a turner to take the spigot off if I'd used a spigot. Um, and that was my way of covering up some, um, not ineptitudes, what's the word? Covering up some lack of my, my, my skill level. So I turned it into a feature instead of I was rough on the bottom. No, I made a feature out of it. But anyway. Uh, you can always distress it to cover the stuff. Yeah, well, that's, that's what I'm talking about, Vince. And the trick is don't over, overdo it. You've got to have it enough to make it look as if you've done it on purpose and you just didn't rip a pile of timber out the side and go, oh, it doesn't matter, we'll just put some uh, patina wax on, on that and finish it. So there's a fine line between not enough and too much. But I'll, I'll allow you to, to find that um, that boundary yourself because we're all different but for you know just the sake of experimentation don't try this stuff on a job straight away go and get some nice timber but short bits that you can't use maybe it's going to be a chopping board maybe it was an off cut but just give it a go with different things you've got around the shop what have, what have I got here that I could oh dear um well there you go not, not the ideal, yes, for a marking gauge, but this has got a knurled nut on the end. So I don't know. Let's have a look. Well, there you go. Bit of, bit of bruising. It, it worked differently to the wire brush. So what I would do then, if that works, I'd go to um, a junk shop or a, a nut and bolt shop and see if you can find a knurled nut. Put it into a bit of timber. Then start whacking the bit of timber. There's another one there. That's all half moon shapes. Let's, let's put a bit of colour on that. I've got to stop because I'll be using everything in the shed otherwise. Ba -da -ba -bum, ba -da -bum. Actually, I think that would have been better had I used a lighter one on the bottom. I don't know. The look see. Don't be afraid to experiment, play. And that's that's what the whole name of the game is really just push yourself, see what you can come up with. Well, I don't know, that, that that's different as well. Um, where are we on? And that was just one that we just played with there, but you get you get these nice shapes, and then I've got a little bit of red in there and a bit of blue. I'd most likely put a bit of black in there. But I mean I'm limited with the colours I've got here. But just just try things. Stain something and then uh, after you've stained it, chip it out. Oh hang on, let's go. Okay, we we stained that, so. 
And, and in this case, I, I will leave um, some flat spots. Uh, I know. I'm just brainstorming here, but that's all you've got to do. There you go, it's a, a different, you can't see, can you? It's a different effect again. So I just started pulling these things out and then you've got colour that's deeper than the outside. So that's going to colour and your outside is going to say, stay the same colour. But it's all about experimentation. Try on little bits and then if you like it, maybe do it on a panel. The idea with that being if you do it on a panel and it doesn't work, you haven't lost anything. Whereas if you're going to do it on a solid door and it doesn't work, well, you've, you've done the solid door, haven't you? Anyway, that's about it for me. Uh, what else? No, that's about it. Just, well, you know how to fit a box hinge. That's a good thing. Um, with that, Remember when you're fitting box hinges to use those two bits of veneer and put it between the masking tape and then that gives you the gap so you won't get a sprung lid when you put your lid together. Only put in two screws per hinge, preferably diagonally. And then if you have a problem, you have still got two fresh bits of meat you can drill into and tap your screws. If it's a complete disaster, get a matchstick, preferably, if not a toothpick, glue it in, clean it up, and then you've got new wood to be working with. And just take your time. Don't rush it. There, there's no... The, if you're doing woodwork because you enjoy it and it's a hobby and relaxation, what's the point of rushing and getting stressed over it? You want to get stressed? Start streaming when your gear doesn't work. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, it's all good. Um, when I'm on next... Yeah, look, I might be doing woodworking masterclass again shortly. As I mentioned before... I, 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 I've just had a new granddaughter and uh, Susie's down in Sydney, there was, I'm not going into it, but there was a, a lot of complications, so i have sort of on, I don't know if I've got to go to the airport or go to Sydney or, or whatever, but yeah, I look, I hope to get back and do it soon, I've got some projects. On the run, I want to do some um, bum, 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 epoxy work on the Carbon Tech channel. Uh, there's some other things we're talking about doing. Yeah, but look, basically, this is your stream. I'm, as you can tell, I, I don't get locked in. So if there's something you want to see, there's something you want to know, if there's something you'd like me to try, give the good people of Carbotech uh, a message or you can email me and we'll get it underway because it's all about uh, pushing the boundaries of woodwork to find out what we can do. Because don't forget the traditional ways weren't traditional when they first started. They were most likely off the wall or somebody found this was a better way of working and someone from the neighbouring village saw what they were doing and then improved on that. So even though you know, oh, traditionally it's done this way, nah. You work your own way of working it out. I was talking to a friend the other day about this great book. If you ever get a chance to read it, I don't know if it's still available, but it's called Nuts, N-U-T-S. And it's about uh, a turnaround in the aircraft industry, uh, the airline industry in, oh, it must have been late 1990s, early 2000s, I think. And there was one phrase that stuck with me. Before you try something new, first work out how you would do it before you find out how other people would do it. That way it leaves you free to think, but unfortunately there's so many people out there who are under this um, pressure of you've got to get it right the first time. No, you've got to get it right eventually, but it doesn't have to be the first time, and your right doesn't have to be the same right as somebody else's. So express yourself, be creative, be an individual. And if everyone's an individual, we're a group of individuals and we're back to being a group. So where does that take you? Anyway, that's it. I'm starting to ramble. This is Steve saying thank you very much for watching Carbotech Woodworking Channel on YouTube. And I'm sure if you've got any problems, they're the people to talk to. Go see them. Um, I will be back shortly with a video for them. You saw me playing around with something there, which is we're doing a, a process. It's a joint pro. Bleh. It's a joint program between um, Woodworking Masterclass and 
Carbotec and we're starting at bare basics. I'm talking hammer and nail, taking you right through to cabinetry. And it's done in really small steps. So anyone can do it. And believe me, if I can do it, anyone can do it. So on that note, I bid you all good morning, good afternoon, good night, and how are you? And look forward to having your company in the workshop, at the workbench, again, very, very soon. Again, if you've got any suggestions or feedback, please leave a message down below. Hit the subscribe button and just look after yourself and enjoy what you're doing. This is Steve pulling the shed door down and saying bye for now. Catch you all later on. Remember to keep it sharp, but more importantly, keep it safe. Dusties, eye protection, ear protection, the whole box and dice. Catch you later. Bye for now. Thank you.